Head on Sports Center, we will take a look at a day filled with extreme games. No dudes half-piping on skateboards, but you will see other things flying. His Ernest, for instance. Would the Pacers keep up above or below the rim? The Red Wings winged into St. Louis with three wins. Would they fly out with number four? In baseball, Mark McGuire's bat took flight. And in the Bronx, the Yankees and Orioles just removed the letter L from the word flight. So take our advice. Discretion and patience is the better part of valor. And if you behave, we'll let you go out to the big dance. On Sports Center, next. Hi again, Sports Center, hipping you to what's up, and what's up is a whole lot. <laughs> With Rich Eisen, I'm Stuart Scott. So we have a show for you. The Wings swoop in for the clinch in St. Louis. McGuire goes big fly in Philly, and the Bulls battle the Pacers. But first, the throwdown. In the, the boogie down. That's right. The <laughs> Orioles hit the Bronx Tuesday. A desperate bunch coming off a four-game sweep at the hands of the expansion Devil Rays at home. 14 games behind the Yankees in the loss column. So Baltimore definitely needed to take at least two of three from the Yankees in their three-game set. The last thing the O's needed to do was galvanize a team that's already off to a ridiculously hot start and coming off a perfect game. And speaking of coming off that perfect game, Derek Jeter was perfect in 14 games, having extended his hitting streak in the first inning and in the bottom of the second game tied at one run on second for Jeter. Jeffrey Hammonds. Robs Jeter at the wall, rips up the wall, hits the wall, worthy of a second gander. Hammonds robs Jeter of a double, perhaps a triple with a great catch. Top of the third, the O's up 2-1 on David Cohn and load the bases against David Cohn. And David Cohn leaves one out over the plate for Harold Baines, who takes it right up the middle, base hit. Hammonds and Roberto Alomar come on down, the O's up 4-1. They take a 5-1 lead into the bottom of the fourth. Scott Brocious on second, Joe Girardi. Base hit. Brady Anderson tells Brocious, those who are late do not get fruit cup. Willie Randolph, always aggressive in the third base coach's box. But the Yankees would be down just 5-4 in the eighth inning. Two out, two on for Bernie Williams, and he takes Armando Benitez into the upper deck, no doubt about it. Three-run shot, Yanks up 7-5, and Benitez takes out his anger on Tino Martinez. Next pitch plunks him. Benitez immediately ejected. The Yankees take immediate umbrage. Darrow leads the charge from the dugout. And Graham Lloyd leads the charge from the bullpen. Oh, holy heck, breaking loose. Getting in their shots, and Darrow would get in his shot on Benitez. Yankees very touchy about Martinez, and everybody touching everybody. And this was the scariest moment when everybody's spilling into the dugout. George Steinbrenner looking on and concerned. Calm was restored, and the first pitch after Calm restored, Tim Raines tells the Orioles scoreboard. Takes Bobby Munoz deep and gone for a two-run shot. The Yanks come back from a 5-1 deficit. This game went off without incident in the ninth inning, and the Yankees win a wild one, 9-5, from the perfect game to the imperfect game. This fight occurred one day after the 22-year anniversary of the infamous Lou Pinella, Carlton Fisk, Craig Nettles, Bill Spaceman, Lee Brawl at the stadium. The Orioles fall 12 games behind the Yankees, 15 back in the lost column in a game that will cause far more ripples than the ones in the East standings. As in, should baseball have a you-can't-leave-the-bench you rule like hoops in hockey? As in, if pitchers hit in the American League, would Benitez feel free to plunk Tino between the two and the four? As in, if AL President Gene Budick has a beeper, how quickly did it go off? Now for the reaction, including quintessential George M. Steinbrenner III. See, when you get a guy throwing 100 miles an hour and, and he does something like that, you know, it's, you, know you understand the, frust the frustration of giving up a home run, but that doesn't by any means justify that action. I think, you know, you give a home run, you know, you be a, a professional. Be a man. Be a man as bad as I've seen a fight. Uh, in my years playing baseball, I mean, this is, this is pretty ugly right here. You ought to be suspended for a month. You could really kill a guy the way he threw that ball if you look closely at it. How do you feel about your team? How, how can you feel? We took it right to him. I feel very proud of them, all of them. I guess if you can't win ball games, you got to try to win fights. I guess that's what it is. That's the worst I've seen in 25 years in the game. But that guy, they should take a close look at him and how he threw that pitch. That was terrible. Everybody in here is frustrated the way things have been going for us, but um, it seemed like uh, it reached a boiling point. And Mondo's frustrated. He gets a home run hit off him. They take the lead, and he hits the next guy. And uh, as far as being in Tino's shoes, I'd be upset, too, because 
you never want to get hit by that little white ball and you got throwing 97, 98 miles per hour on purpose. I mean, that's dangerous um, and you hate to see it, but uh, it's part of the game and uh, we will hopefully move on. Are you worried about the next two games, George? What's up, what might happen? Well, I hope nothing happens. I just hope we keep kicking the hell out of them. That's all. That's what I hope. That's the best way to tell them. George, does the league have an obligation to make a statement here? Well, I don't know. I think Gene, Dr. Butig will react tomorrow, certainly. He'll study it carefully, and then I think he'll see what I saw, and hopefully he will react. Now, he may react by saying he wants Peter and Angelos and I to go three rounds and settle it. Then I'm ready. I'm working out three days a week. <laughs> Where's Costanza? Yet another loss and yet another blown save for the Orioles pen, which was the team's backbone last season. There are three blown saves short of last season's total, and they certainly miss Randy Myers, not just his numbers either. As you saw in this game, the O's miss his intangibles as well. We'll have more on Benitez v. Martinez later in the show. NBA hoops now. Challengers act like Indiana, figuring out how to avoid another 26 turnovers or getting Chris Mullen more than two points. Curiously, though, champions act like if the win isn't perfect, it didn't exist. If the three top scorers go 14 for 48 or the team goes 0 for 6 on threes, it's failure. Just hours before game two, Scottie Pippen told me the Bulls have to get it together. He didn't even mention the game one win. He sounded like he was down one zip. Very Jordan-esque. Very scary. Before the game, David Stern gives Michael Jordan his fifth MVP trophy. First quarter, Chris Mullen says, forget that two-point mess. Mullen, 11 points in the first half. Later in the first, Scottie Pippen robbing Mark Jackson blind. Then Pip's going to bank in the jumper. Mark Jackson, seven turnovers in game one, seven turnovers in game two. Scottie Pippen blowing up with 21. Final seconds of the first quarter. Call Jordan bus driver because he took Reggie Miller to school. Michael went seven minutes without scoring, then had 17 in the first half. Miller struggled. He was 5 for 14 shooting in game 1. Game 2, more bricks. Reggie Miller just 4 of 13 shooting in the game. Meanwhile, Michael Jordan off the hook. Buzzer beater, final seconds of the half. Here comes Mike over Miller. Mike was money. He said later of the MVP, I felt pressure to prove you guys didn't make a mistake in your voting, but the Bulls down seven at the break. Final seconds of the third, Jordan tight banging, y'all. 14 points in the third alone. Derek McKee said, I can't speak for the way that Wilt played, but I've seen this guy firsthand, seen him too much. How about seeing Steve Kerr drain the three-pointer? Bulls, four threes in the game. Then Michael Jordan frustrated the Pacers some more. Bulls get 26 points off 20 Pacer turnovers. Jordan passes Magic Johnson, most steals all time in the playoffs with 362. And Mike straight butter coming off the floor, 13 of 22 from the field. And then Michael Jordan puts the Pacers away. Drives baseline like a jazz man tickling the ivory. 41 points, 35th career playoff game with 40 or more. Bulls win at 104-98. Mike's 41, his highest in the postseason this year. It's also his highest playoff game since dropping 55 on the then Bullets last year. Did I mention Mike's five assists, Rich? Yes. How about his four steals? I think so. Or his four rebounds? About as most valuable as MVP get. Scotty Pippen's MVP-like line, 21 points, six boards, five steals, five assists, three block shots. The Bulls as a team, only six turnovers. Chicago's won their last 19 playoff series when leading two games to none. Michael hit a lot of great shots, a lot of tough shots. Uh, well, I guess tough shots for most people before him is sort of routine. And um, Same case, you know, he gets bailed out on a lot of calls and gets to the free throw line and uh, he keeps his confidence. But uh, when you're MVP of the league, you tend to get them calls. Larry, I, I think, sounds more like a coach when he starts to complain that I'm getting more calls than, than his team's getting. You know, I, I think he, you know, back in the day when he played, we, we certainly complained about all the calls he was getting. So now he's truly a coach right there. You know, they're the champs. And you can't decision the champs. You gotta, you gotta knock out the champ. And right now, you know, we're the only ones that are taking all the punches. In a comparison of starting backcourts in this series, Michael Jordan has just dominated everything. But Ron Harper and the rest of the Bulls have combined to hound the Pacers with persistent sticky defense, resulting in 26 and 20 turnovers in game one and two. I'll do the math, 46 combined. Harper second on the team in scoring in game one with 15 points, added seven points and nine rebounds in game two. Mark Jackson has 20 points to go along with his 14 turnovers. 
To baseball now, Frederick Douglass once said, power concedes nothing without demand. It never has, and it never will. Mark McGuire spent so much time taking BP not to leave people with their jaws hanging down to their knees, but because he demands perfection. His 478-foot homer Monday night, longer than most big leaguers could ever hit, was his shortest of the three he hit this past week. Even Mike Piazza, a fat slugger himself, admits, I'm not even close to McGuire. Power conceding nothing without demand. Big Mac, BP. Hey, this week he's hit bombs of 545 and 527. That's in real games. Top one, McGuire's first at bat against the Phillies. Tyler Green schools the 312 hitter. Top third, one on for McGuire. Now let me hear you say, oh, na 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 na. Number 18 of the year, 440 feet, three zip cards. Top five, McGuire again. Now let me hear you say, oh, 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 na 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 na. Number 19 of the year, 471 feet, 44th career multi-homer game, 44th. 5-2 cards. Bottom 5, 7-2 cards. Scott Rowland with Greg Jeffries in first. Rowland rips a shot to left. His seventh, 7-4 seven, cards. Next batter, Rico Bronya. Grounds one up the middle. Ray Langford misses it. Bronya to third. E8 on Langford. All the way back to the warning track. Next batter, Mike Lieberthal. Peace. Two-run shot, his third of the year. Phillies cut the lead. They're down 7-6. Next inning, Doug Glanville lines one to center. Again, Langford boots it. Kevin Sepsik around third. Glanville safe at second. Two costly errors on Langford. Four batters later, still tied at seven. Sacks Jack for Lieberthal. Lieberthal grounds back to pitcher John Frascatore. Frascatore comes home. Tom Pagnazzi goes to first. Hits Lieberthal in the head. No interference. Scott Rowland scores. Lieberthal out of the base path. He should have been out. He wasn't. Top eight, Mark McGuire's fourth at bat. Big Mac trying to break off something real proper. The pitch. Swing and his third home run of the night. It's going to go into the upper deck. Wow. Man, oh man. He is something else. Oh, the fat. Watch Terry Francona. He's like, oh man. Fourth career three homer game, second this year. Said McGuire of a standing ovation he got from Philly fans. I wish every player could experience that. Cards win the game 10 to 8. Card skipper Tony La Russa has seen all four Big Macs three homer games. He said, I've got to figure out where this one goes in the list. McGuire now has 407 career homers, tying Duke Snyder for 24th on the all-time list. Afterward, the question that everybody wants to ask, and McGuire is sick of hearing, can you break Miris's record? It doesn't really matter how far it goes, right? A home run's a home run. And... Um I'm just glad we held on to the game. Mark, a night like tonight obviously gets the fans and us, the media, talking about the record. Do you, do you let that sing into your head at all? I, I know. I, I'm sticking to my statement. I've said it all along, and I think every hitter that you guys ask these things until somebody gets to 50 by September, then it's a legitimate thing to talk about. But right now, I don't think there is. In the exact same number of games and at-bats between this year and last year, Mark McGuire so far improved on his home run pace of a year ago. That's when he had 58 jacks at the end of the year, a record for right-handers. And on top of all this, he's improved his batting in general, increasing his average and his RBI. Can we just stop the season and give this guy the MVP? We talked about it when the Carolina Hurricanes signed him to the offer sheet. We talked about it when the Red Wings matched it. We talked about it at the beginning of the playoffs, and we're talking about it now because Sergei Fedorov is finally on the precipice. If the Red Wings could beat the Blues Tuesday night to reach the conference finals, then the Fedorov bonus would kick into the astronomical tune of $12 million. <laughs> How would that translate into rubles? <laughs> First period, scoreless off the faceoff. Chris Draper wins the faceoff. Darren McCarty beats Grant Fuhr just like that. He beats Mark Bergevin before he beats Grant Fuhr. one nothing Wings. Later in the first, Wings on a power play and show off some nifty passing. Igor Lurianov to Stevie Eiserman to Doug Brown. Coming off a separated right shoulder first. Goal of the playoffs because this was his first game of this series. Wings up 2 to nothing. Late in the first period, watch the spot shadow. That's Jeff Cortnall giving a two-handed slash to Nicholas Lindstrom. No penalty called. Norris Trophy finalist was down. Cortnall was not. Lindstrom would get up, and he'd be a factor. Second period, 2 nothing. Wings on the power play again. Lindstrom the shot. Martin Lapointe, the rebound goal. 3 nothing. Wings, one of two Lapointe goals in the night. Wings got some nifty goaltending as well. Chris Osgood, Stone's Brett Hull, Scotty Bowman, Stoic. 
Third period wings up four to nothing, looking to add to their lead. Tomas Holstrom goes in on Fjord and beats him. Fifth of the playoffs for Holstrom. Five nothing wings. Fjord pulled, distressed, throwing equipment. Fedorov, Cha, Ching. <laughs> Brett Hall leaves the ice, perhaps the last time in a St. Louis Blues uniform. Wings take the series four games to two, six to one in the final games of the series. So the Wings eliminate the Blues for the third consecutive season and eliminated them in this series by winning in St. Louis three times. As for Fedorov, he gets his 12 million in one lump sum. How cool would it be if they had a Brink Zamboni drive out and drop it on center ice? Sergey's also enjoying the other benefit of his holdout. I don't play 59 games. I missed five months of the regular season, and it seems to me uh, that kicks in right now, and I'm glad my feet moving well, and uh, I'm thinking very positively about what happened out there on the ice. It really wasn't our intention to sit on any lead. Uh, you know, uh, we, we were fortunate to get the second goal in the power play. Uh, I don't think we played really well a after that at the, towards the end of the first period. We came out stronger in the second. We were able to get a couple goals, obviously. Our plan wasn't to sit back at all. We felt if we can keep pressuring and pressuring. The Wings went 9-1 at the Joe in their cup run last year. The Blues beat them twice at the Joe in this series alone. But as we mentioned, the Wings were sublime in St. Louis. 3-0, 14 goals, and Chris Osgood was stingy in goal. Still, Still ahead, Nick Player say this showed how much heart their coach has. And they also joked that he looked like a jockey that fell off his horse, but they liked his heart. On Tuesday, David Stern invited Van Gundy and Raleigh to town to talk heart and sportsmanship. Also on the way, big unit, that's not a pick! <laughs> J.D. Drew wanted some luck, but an arbitrator said not the kind of luck that he wanted. And will it be a hunt for a Super Bowl or a hunt for a new owner? Stick and stay, we're coming back. This is the latest video game we're developing, and this is our inspiration, my Volkswagen Jetta. Excellent. When you write code for 15 hours straight, you gotta get out. The Jetta's a real German road car with plenty of room for four carbon-based life forms. It's got dual airbags, daytime running lights, and side impact door beams. Because in real life, there is no reset button. On the road of life, there are passengers and there are drivers. Sometimes I dream that he is me. Got to see that's how I dream to be. Bom, 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 bom. I dream my move. I dream my move. I might. If I could be like Mike. If I could be like What's up, Mike? I'm not going to sing. Buy as good as it gets on video now. Simon. Ah! Carol. I'm not going to sleep with you. Melvin. Help! Three unlikely friends. Some just have great stories. Just no one in this car. Yours to own. Your white caveman chiseled on walls. Cut me a break. Academy Award winner Jack Nicholson. Did you have sex with her? Academy Award winner Helen Hunt. It was better than sex. Academy Award nominee Greg Kinnear. From James L. Brooks. Yeah. As good as it gets. Buy to own on video cassette and DVD now. Rustolian, the ultimate defense against weather. A good sweat isn't so good once the game is over. That's why there's Irish Spring Sport. It has an extra antibacterial ingredient that kills odor causing germs better than regular soap. It's Irish Spring Sport. Play as hard as you like. The Texas Ranger media guide says Rusty Rose and Tom Schieffer own the ball club. Nah, the Mariners own Texas. Own them like they bought them. 37 and 11 against the Rangers the last four years. Now, maybe you think, yeah, but with Rick Helling trying to join teammate Aaron Seeley as the only seven-game winners, nobody owns Texas. And then you find out Randy Johnson's opposite Helling and big unit 13-3 and three lifetime against Texas and junior tied A-Rod for the AL Home Run League with 16 on Monday. And you probably say, oh... Or you say Randy Johnson's just going to make my lead in, Nolan Boyd. Down here in Texas. Hadn't lost to Texas since 93, got shelled. First batter of the game, Luis Alisea representing down the line. Alisea's seventh double this year. Next batter, Mark McLemore, a 305 hitter. Bloops it in for an RBI single. McLemore two for five of the day. Rangers up one zip after two batters. Third inning, 3-1 Texas. Johnson can't even get the ball.
to first on a pickoff attempt. Goes over David Seguin's head. Pud Rodriguez goes to second. Same batter. Juan Gonzalez on a low slider walks. Rangers sent eight right-handed batters against Johnson. Johnny Holt said, what do we have to lose? We were 0-8 against them. Set up Mike Sims with two on, and Sims taps it out. Three-run jack to right center. His third, ninth home run Johnson has allowed this season. Randy gives up five hits, six runs, and three innings, only two Ks. Said Lou Pinella afterward, I don't have an explanation for it. I'm concerned. Final score is 10 to 4. Randy Johnson loses to the Rangers for the first time in 13 starts against him. His ERA 6.93, his highest since April 20th, 1989. That was when he was with Montreal. On Wednesday, the Mariners tried to rebound, sending Bill Swift to the hill against Darren Oliver. Seems that Tom Clancy is going to need a Jack Ryan-like escape to keep intact his bid to become majority owner of the Minnesota Vikings. One day after the author was a no-show at the Finance Committee meeting convened in part to have the league's concerns over his bid assuaged, one published reports out of Minneapolis has Clancy pulling out altogether. Another report has Clancy staying involved with limited interest. Whatever his involvement, it must come to the NFL in some written form by the end of the business day, Wednesday. Coming up, the Indian sent many a shot walward in Kansas City, and Jeff Conan didn't shag all of them. And Scotty was shagadelic in his defense against Mark Jackson. We'll go back to Chicago in a moment. Hi, Little John here for Earl Oldsmobile GMC Truck. I love to joke around, but when it comes to buying a car or truck, I get very serious. If you're a West Sider in the market for a new or used car or truck, Earl Oldsmobile GMC Truck is the place to go. If you haven't seen Oldsmobile in the last two years, you haven't seen Oldsmobile. So go see Earl Oldsmobile GMC Truck, your transportation specialist. 11300 Brook Park Road, between West 130th and Tiedemann Road. Tell them Little John sent you. Without Cablevision, home entertainment wouldn't be complete. You wouldn't see so many channel choices and you wouldn't see them in crystal clear Cablevision clarity. With Cablevision, you get the whole picture, including channels created by Cablevision, like American Movie Classics, Fox Sports, and Bravo. So when you consider the alternatives, aren't you glad you've chosen a company that's got a complete picture of your home entertainment needs? Cablevision, raise your expectations. I think this, uh, actually this doesn't have much to do with sports. Um, this, uh, was in an aquarium um, my dentist had and I first time I got my teeth cleaned I was waiting out there for like so long I don't know what it is about some doctors they just make you wait that's my first introduction into that that's why I don't really go to doctors anymore but anyways I, I was waiting and I was just playing around with the fish I just you know, sort of clipped it a little five finger discount yeah. that's something I'm proud of is anybody in the American League Central going to give the Indians a run for their money the Tribe has lost seven of their last ten, a fall to 23-19, and 19, and still their lead is a chunky five games over second-place Minnesota. Only seven games back, the Kansas City Royals sit in the central cellar and had a golden opportunity to put a modicum of pressure on Cleveland. Game one of a three-game set in KC Tuesday, and O.J. was in the driver's seat. Gets Johnny Damon. Maybe Johnny's due here, but he takes this. Chad then gets Shane Halter. Swing it. Later, Dean Palmer, swinging. O.J., effective. Top of the fifth, tied at two. Pat Rapp facing Omar Vizquel with two men on. Vizquel, base hit in the corner. Two runs, come on in to score. It is four to two Indians. Next batter is Jim Tomei. And Tomei busts out the intentional walking stick. Manny Ramirez takes offense, so he then busts out the whooping stick. First home run in 67 at-bats. That's why Tony Muser intentionally walked Tomei to get to him, but it backfired. 7-2 Indians. Not all things were great for the Indians. O.J. throws a pitch. You can see he's hurt in the seventh inning. Hargrove concern. O.J. would leave the game with an injured right pectoral muscle. So it's a somewhat pyrrhic 16-3 victory. A most emphatic fourth consecutive loss for KC, which fell to 6-16 six and 16 at home. The seven-run fifth, the best frame for the Tribe this season. Their 20 hits, also a season high. On Wednesday, the Royals turn to Tim Belcher to turn it around. Cleveland starts Charles Nagy. The aforementioned Twins hosting the Tigers, and the Twins come up with 15 more hits than they had off of David Wells. In fact, Todd Walker let off the game for the Twins with a hit, so they stopped that whole thing right there. And then said Tom Kelly, one of the reasons we got off so well, not that we got embarrassed, but you don't want somebody to throw a no-hitter or a perfect game against you, Brad Radke threw a complete game.
Bulls go up in the Pacers two games to nothing, and from the Department of Redundancy Department, Scottie Pippen blowing up a seriously fat game, and few people noticed because Michael Jordan was fatter. Lost in the shuffle of MJ's 41 points, Scottie Pippen hung a line on Indiana that any player would just drool about. 21 points, 6 rebounds, 5 steals, 5 assists, 3 blocked shots. You cannot play any better. Afterward, Pip hung out with our Bonnie Bernstein. Scotty, I guess this is kind of becoming the typical line for you in the playoffs. Five steals, three blocks, five assists, six rebounds. You got your 21 points. You a little tired? Yeah, I'm pretty exhausted tonight, you know, getting up and having to try to control Jackson up for nine and four feet and do that throughout the game. It really takes a toll on him. But, you know, it's part of what we have to do to win this series. You've been harassing him and poking and prodding and swiping at him for two games. Now, at what point in game two did you sense he was really getting frustrated? Well, I sort of sensed it at the beginning of the game. I started to look over my shoulder, seeing a lot of picks and things being set up court and, you know, realizing at that point if I can make their offense come up, then I've already disrupted their offense. You've really placed your emphasis on defense in this series, yet something you rarely do. I actually saw you out there shooting around before the game. You still trying to get those points? You had 21 tonight? Well, I haven't really found a good rhythm offensively, and I think it has a lot to do with me being fatigued, wearing myself down from a defensive standpoint. And I just tried to get here today and shoot a little bit early before the game and try to get a little bit more familiar with the baskets. Phil said after game one, I'm not so sure either one of these teams is going to get to 100 points. You score 104 today. A little bit surprising to you? That was a little bit surprising. I mean, we shot a little bit better, I guess, at the beginning of the game than we did in game one. We got off to such a poor start. We missed too many easy shots. And today, I think we came up with a more conscious effort trying to get the ball in the basket. Scotty Pippen with 21. Michael Jordan, 41 points. His playoff high this year. The Bulls take a 2-0 lead as they head down I-65 to Indianapolis. Bonnie, thanks, Scotty. Thanks for the time. Coming up, Brant Brown's become a regular in the Cubs lineup and because of plays like this. And because Joey Galloway plays like this, he's become a regular on special teams, bucking the trend in the NFL. We go inside the huddle in a moment. Can we enhance performance by simply moving a battery? Is it possible to combine the ease of an automatic with the fun of a manual? Is everyone comfortable with the concept of cab-forward design? These are the questions. This is the answer. Dodge Stratus. Now select Dodge and competitive owners can get $1,500 cash back on Dodge Stratus. Introducing the Sicilian pizza from Pizza Hut. The most intense tasting pizza ever. This ain't no waltz through the daffodils. It's a sprint through a minefield with four corners. This is as much oregano, basil, and garlic as you can jam into the crust without the government regulating it. I got one word for you, pal. Duck and cover! This is the mother of all pizzas. Our new Sicilian pizza only at Pizza Hut. Only $8.99. For the absolute mother of a deal, get up to three toppings or any specialty pizza for two bucks more. Can you handle it? A snowflake falls at the far end of history. And that snowflake, we'll call him Steve, winds up as part of a droplet of water. And one day, that droplet, Steve's droplet, could wind up in a brewery where a man you'll never meet discovers the perfect temperature to frost brewed beer. And like that, Steve is in a Coors Light can, and then a tray, and a cup. And now, he's here with you. So I ask you, gentle stranger, do not spill, Steve. Coors Light! She grabs $5 million and splits for the X Games. The FBI calls her Fabiola. She's 19 years old and weighs a buck ten. What's she gonna do, Chief? Break my heart? And this summer, the most wanted woman in America isn't just beautiful. She's dynamite. The X Games, coming June 20th. That's why they call it the X Games, baby. Jeff Van Gundy took a personal scouting tour of Alonzo Mourning's ankle. Pat Riley said it was personal between Zoe and Larry Johnson, and it was too bad the former didn't connect with the latter, but Riley didn't quite use the word latter. Well, on Tuesday, Commissioner Stern sat each coach down in separate meetings, and we don't really know what words the commission used to convey his consternation, but in a press release, Stern said, we discussed the responsibility of players and coaches in this league to set a positive example for all those who follow our game. I believe each of them appreciates what we are committed to, eliminating violence in the NBA, and that they are expected to be and should be part of the solution. Well, Riley agreed. In a Tuesday night conference call, Riley said, what I said was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. 
Next year, we'll sit down and talk. It's going to be about professionalism. The point is, let's get rid of the extracurricular crap and win games. Stuart? Whether or not the diss was intentional, and it's tough to diss a guy who hit 362 with 40 homers in 97, but Ramon Martinez is gooey gushing of new three-time gold glove catcher Charles Johnson could be a backhanded backhand of Mike Piazza. Said Martinez of CJ, when you have a catcher like him, it really helps. I can just concentrate on pitching and don't have to worry about base running. Hidden meaning? Don't know. Dodgers and Cubs. Gary Sheffield getting his old number 10 back. Chef, four of seven as a Dodger. Jim Riggleman giving signs. Seriously. Raul Mondesi rubs one out deep to left for a solo shot. His ninth homer this year. Fifth career jack off Steve Traxel. Two on Dodgers over the Cubs. Same inning, 3 1. Todd Hollinsworth on third. Eric Young bloops a shot to center, but Brant Brown getting busy with his glove, with the leather. Oh. Shorty also with his bat getting busy, hitting 360 this year. Watch it again. All right, so what? He's only one for five hitting in this game. Who's counting? And Mark Grace. You know Mark Grace is like butter because he has just been on a roll. Hitting 337 this year. He's hit 424 his last eight games. Mickey Morandini, Sammy Sosa score. 5-3 Cubs. Rod Beck in to close it out in the ninth. Gets Eric Karros to go too far. Karros did, though, snap a 72 at-bat homerless streak. Beck got Charles Johnson swinging. And then, Jim Eisenreich, you ain't got to go home, kid, but you got to get the heck up out of here. Rod Beck's NL leading 14th save. Cubs win it 6-3. Just sounds kind of funny to say the Cubs have won for the seventh time in eight games. Mark Grace, during that eight-game streak I told you about, he's hitting 424 during that streak. 13 RBI in those eight games as well. On Wednesday, they go at it again. A couple of five and two pitchers, Hideo Nomo and Kevin Tappany. Padres looking for six straight at Pittsburgh. Bottom two, no score, two out. Tony Womack, who led the NL with 60 stolen bases last year. Leading off first base. Oh, but he got picked off. Carlos Hernandez gunned him down. Top of the sixth inning, one zip Pirates, no out. Steve Finley at the plate. Kilvio Veris on first. Kilvio is running and Finley whacks one into right center field. Veris breaks for second. Finley deep to right center, but Jermaine Allensworth makes a great running catch. Veris already around second. Tried to hustle back. Womack's relay is in time to double him up. Allensworth play preserves the one-run lead. Bottom six, Mark Smith on second. Jose Guillen just ripping stuff up. Hits it into the right field. Smith coming home in the play. Tony Gwynn's throw, not in time. Guillen, a 354 hitter, two for four in the day. Pittsburgh goes on to win it three to nothing. The Padres' five-game winning streak ends as the rookie Jose Silva gets his third straight win. He was also the first Pittsburgh starter to make it past the sixth inning in five games. He had never lasted longer than seven innings in 12 previous career starts. He went eight innings here. Giants Brewers, top four, four zip Brewers. Mark Newfield takes Sean Estes out. Newfield's first home run of the year, first home run in more than a year. And Bernie Brewer chilling. Six zip Brewers, top six, six two Milwaukee. Sacks Jack, Barry Bonds. Big tall brother, six two, want to hit you. Yo, what you want to do? Deep to center field, off the top of the fence, inches away from a grand slam. Instead, two run double. Bonds, three for four of the day. 32 RBI, he said, just didn't hit it high enough. Bottom eight. Julian Tavares pitching for the Giants. Strikes out Darren Jackson. Then talks a little noise to the Brewer dugout. And Daryl Strawberry comes over the top and punches Julian. All right. Oh, wrong game. What is up with that? What is up? Bottom nine. Two on for Jeremy Burnitz. Jeremy Burnitz. Three-run, game-winning home run. He said, I'm not looking to hit a home run. Just looking to put the ball and play hard. That's hardcore. His ninth jack of the season. Brewers win the game. 9-6. to six. The Brewers blow a 6 nothing lead. How about this for Doug Jones? He blows his fourth save in 15 chances, but gets credit for the win. A blown save and a W. Mark Newfield's homer, his first since May 3rd, 1997. On Wednesday, Oral Hershiser tries to even up his record at 3-3. Three and three. Call it Green Glossnost. Bill Parcells has invited Neil O'Donnell to minicamp, perhaps the first step in the thawing out process between the coach and quarterback. Forget about last year's benchings. The Tuna made the invite even though he wants O'Donnell to restructure his contract to help with the Jets' tight cap, and thus far, O'Donnell has refused. Said Parcells, I've been thinking it over, and I thought it was right that he be here. With more NFL news, we seek out a huddled up John Clayton. Power notified the Pittsburgh Steelers of the start of contract extension talks of his plans to hire an agent, whom he recently identified as Robert Fraley. 
What surprised the Steelers is that Cower needed an agent after they came within a couple hundred thousand dollars of meeting his $2 million a year demands. Highest for a head coach who doesn't have general manager responsibilities and fourth highest overall. Cower has two years remaining on his contract and has expressed interest in jumping to the expansion Cleveland Browns. Braley is also the agent for Jets coach general manager Bill Parcells, who heads the list at $2.4 million. Donta Culpepper of Central Florida and Donovan McNabb of Syracuse rank 1-2 in next year's talented list of draftable quarterbacks, according to early reports from NFL college scouts. Brock Hewitt of Washington isn't far behind as a possible first-round prospect. At 245 pounds, Culpepper resembles Steve McNair of the Tennessee Oilers. Of course, each of those senior quarterbacks will have to take a back seat if Kentucky underclassman Tim Couch decides to turn pro early. McNair and Oilers coach Jeff Fisher will be enjoying their first taste of a home field advantage in years based on early ticket sales at their new temporary home. The Oilers have sold more than 60% of the 41,000 seats at Vanderbilt Stadium in Nashville in less than a month. And they are still going through their list of PSL buyers for their new stadium in Nashville, with general public sales yet to come. After playing before crowds too small to fill a hockey arena, the Oilers may finally force opponents into silent counts when their blitzing defense gets on a roll. Unsigned linebacker Ron Cox told the Chicago Bears he'd rather take his chances hunting in Africa than return for less than a starter's salary. He severed his relationship with the Bears following an African safari in which he killed nine different species, including one called a kudo. Teammates at training camp will miss him because last summer he rid them of a noisy raccoon outside their dorms with a bow and arrow. Inside the Huddle, I'm John Clayton, ESPN. Thanks, John. Still ahead, 35 times he scored at least 40 in a playoff game, and we're still like, dang, that brother's bad. And bad in a bad way, more in the Yankees-Orioles brawl. One George Steinbrenner called the worst fight he's seen in a baseball game in a quarter century. He will wear a cast-like bone stimulator with electrodes and such. And he'll try and get back in a month. My patience is wearing thin, he said, but what can you do? Ball game in a quarter century. He will wear a cast-like bone stimulator with electrodes and such. And he'll try and get back in a month. My patience is wearing thin, he said, but what can you do? His angels hosted the Athletics Tuesday night and... Chuck Finley had it working. Jason Giambi swinging in the fourth. Scott Spezio swinging. And then A.J. Hinch in the fifth looking. Finley, eight strikeouts on the night. Turned a 3-0 lead over Troy Percival in the ninth. And with two on, one out, Mike McFarlane rips a pinch hit ground rule double. In comes Jason Giambi. Cuts the Angels lead to 3-1 off of Troy Percival. Matt Stairs, next batter. Base hit. Scott Spezio, come on down. It's now a 3-2 Angels lead. Ricky Henderson sack fly would tie the game up at three. Percival did not finish the inning. Shigatoshi Hasegawa did. We go to extra innings. Bottom of the 10th, two on, one out. Tied at three. Cecil Fielder grounds to Mike Flowers. And a day after hitting the cycle, he bounces one in the dirt, and his E5 gives Darren Erstadt home plate, and the Angels the 4-3 to three victory. Chuck Finley, eight innings pitch, four hits, eight strikeouts, no decision. After winning 14 straight decisions, Finley hasn't won in his last four starts. Troy Percival, second blown save in 13 chances. Angels beat the A's for the first time this year after winning 11 of 12 from them last year. Devil Rays and Blue Jays. Woody Williams setting the tone. Dave Martinez. Swing and open the game. My English teacher would call that a harbinger. Bottom of the first, Jose Canseco takes Dennis Springer's knuckleball deep and gone. Jose's 13th, 2-1 Jays. Williams had his curve working. Mike Kelly say hello to Lord Charles. Well, Uncle Charlie. And Martinez looking at it. Williams a no-hitter through six. So the Jays ignore him in the dugout. That's the way things go. No hit. Bids need some defense. And Carlos Delgado provided it. Robs Wade Boggs. No hitter through seven. Mel Queen on the phone of the bullpen. Just in case. And Kevin Stocker, however, brings the no-hit bid to an end in the eighth inning. That'll wrap it up for the no-no. Bottom of the eighth, Craig Griebeck hit by Springer's knuckleballer. But... Jim Evans says, stay right here. You could have boarded the pitch. The thing went two miles an hour. <laughs> Jays win 3-1 to one as Williams goes eight innings, one hit, one run. Set manager Tim Johnson of Williams. He's been our most consistent pitcher. He's been outstanding. Said Wade Boggs, what a fabric. No, actually, Boggs said, I think he's getting better as the years go by. He knows how to pitch. High praise indeed, Stewart.
George Steinbrenner was visibly shaking when he began his post-game post-fight news conference, but by the time it ended, the Yankee owner had calmed down enough to make a joke about an ugly brawl, saying maybe Bud Selig will have Steinbrenner and Orioles owner Peter Angelo settle the whole thing by going three rounds. Added George, I've been working out three times a week. It's good stuff, George. Too bad it doesn't take away any of the bad taste. Now, the origins of Tuesday night's brawl may have been from three years ago. Armando Benitez, then a rookie, gave up a grand slam to Seattle's Edgar Martinez. Next Mariner batter, Tino Martinez got drilled by Benitez. That almost touched off a serious brawl. Now, back to the here and now. On Tuesday night, it was Tino, of course, a Yankee getting drilled again. Watch what he says. That's two times that that's happened. It touched off the 10-minute fist fight. Afterward, the fight was over. The bad blood still simmered. Benitez, the skipper, was his defense attorney. I would have been very little. I had a couple people not come in and start throwing punches. And later in the fight, there was some cheap shots taken. But above and beyond all that, I think uh, we've been going through a lot of things. A lot of people have been saying that we need more emotion, that we need to fire up a little bit more. And I think tonight was a coming together, hopefully, for this team. You know, we're just out there to defend. Uh, and I think what would put an end to this thing, have the pitcher get up there and hit one time. Uh, that's, that's the downside to the DH. The, the pitcher gets a little braver when he doesn't have to get up there and face the music. You, know, you got a guy on the mound that throws 100 miles an hour. You know, it's not fun he throwing at someone. I don't think that's the first time he's hit Tino either. But that was just dumb. I thought it was a classless act committed by a guy who I understand has done things like this before. It has no part in the game with players being paid what they're paid. I guess maybe the best way to get rid of it is to do away with the DH. <laughs> Has anything made you that, that mad in baseball? No, not before, never. I feel as though I'm pretty mild-mannered. You don't know who Graham Lloyd high five, but that's a way of saying, hey, you did right. You think we're gonna have some good ratings maybe. Wednesday night? The rematch, Orioles-Yankees headlines are baseball, doubleheader Wednesday night starting at 7.30. Then at 10.30 Eastern, rising star Ben Grieve and the A's take on the Angels. Wednesday night, right here on ESPN. Found out Graham has a big swing on the golf course, and now we know he's got one on the field as well. Coming up, the Reds, Mets and Reds played too in a resplendent Queens day, and it's good to be the King, or the Bulls, or Scotty Pippen. You get the point, they're, they're good. Iron Man by Huffy. All the strength and endurance of the world's toughest triathlon. Of seven doubleheaders against the Reds, game one, John Nunnally leads off top one, no doubt. Breaks a six for 36 hitting slump, Nunnally's third home run of the year, one zip Reds. Same score, bottom two, Alberto Castillo with 2-1. Castillo rips Brett Tomko's pitch down the third baseline. Carlos Baerga and Bernard Gilkey score in the double. Castillo's fourth two-bagger of the year. 2-1 Mets take the lead. Top four, starts to rain. Some fans head for cover, but some ground crew members say we don't need cover. The game continues. Top five still 2-1. Jones hits Reggie Sanders with a pitch. Sanders literally shaken up. His hand is trembling. Here's why. The ball hits Sanders right on the wrist. He would not return to the field for the sixth inning. Now 4-1 Mets, bottom five, two on for Butch Husky, pulls out his wood. Drives it into the left field seats. Three run shot, he was two for four in the game. Husky's fourth jack of the year. Mets score five in the fifth and win it 7-3. Brett Tomko had been 4-0 and in his last six starts. Brett Tomko loses. He's now 5-2. and two. Game two. Bottom two. Ray Ordonez facing Scott Winchester. Two outs. Ordonez just a 219 hitter getting jiggy with it. Slams one to left center. Rick Wilkins comes around to score. Ordonez getting some wheels. Gets his first triple of the year. He was two for four. He's safe. Next batter, pitcher Brian Bohannon. Bohannon's made three starts and ten relief appearances this year. Lines an RBI single to center. He had two hits in the game. Top five, one on Winchester. Taps one back to Bohannon. Bohannon, nice play, throws to second. Ordonez gets to Carlos Baerga covering it first. Nice double play by Ray and B square. Top nine, five, three Mets, two on, two out. John Franco facing Dimitri Young, representing Queens. He was raised in Brooklyn. Franco's 368th career save and he was uh, 
making sure his uniform fit correctly. Hey now. Mets hang on to win at 5-3. They get their first doubleheader sweep in almost two years. Brian Bohannon lowers his ERA to 1.59. John Franco's ninth save in 11 chances this year. I told you he's 368th for his career. Moves him past former Met Jeff Reardon for third all-time. Astros beginning a three-game set in Montreal. First game at Roofless Olympic Stadium. Top one, Moises Alou facing Carlos Perez. Alou pops it up to short center. F.B. Santangelo and Rondell White. Oh, oh my goodness. White would make the catch. Santangelo was hurting. Check out the replay. Santangelo continued to play the inning, but he was removed in the third because of that collision. Bottom of the second, no score. Rondell White facing Pete Shurek. Field. Rondell this White came in hitting 625 lifetime against Shirt. His fourth home of the year. He's now hitting 632. When someone asked him if he knew he hit that well against him, he said, I had no idea. Expos going to win the game 4-2. Said Chris Widger about his three RBI night. I didn't hit the ball all that hard, but I happened to get some RBI in RBI situations. I'll take a bit of luck. On Wednesday, Houston's Jose Lima tries to become the NL second seven-game winner. The New York Knicks had no answer for Mark Jackson. Jackson backed in virtually every defender into the low box and pretty much had his way, especially in the Game 5 clincher. That's when Mark ripped off the first playoff triple-double in Pacers history. The Bulls, however, have an answer for Mark Jackson. His name is Scottie Pippen. David Aldridge reports. That Michael Jordan fellow is pretty good. When he gets it to go in, uh, a lot of times you're in trouble because of I mean, uh, double teams, triple teams. Uh, if he can get it off, uh, a lot of times there's a good chance of going in. But the Pacers, while respectful of Jordan's killer shots, thought his teammates, Scottie Pippen and Ron Harper in particular, were getting away with murder. I think somebody has to have um, <laughs> the nerve to blow the whistle. You know what I like to see? I like to see Scotty Pippen guard Michael Jordan full court, like Scotty guards Mark Jackson, and see how long he stays in the game. Back in the day, when he played, we, we certainly complained about all the calls he was getting, so now he's truly a coach right there. <laughs> he's playing great defense. He's a great defensive player, but there's an awful lot of contact on him. I think I paid my dues in this league where I'm not a young guy. A call should be made. Hey, call me for offensive, call me for something, but something has to be done. Pippen's coast-to-coast -coast defense on Jackson and Harper's hand-to-hand -hand combat with Reggie Miller continue to slow down two of Indiana's biggest weapons. Right now, you know, we're the only ones that are taking all the punches. We haven't thrown any yet, so... Um, and I think that's, that's why they're getting all the calls, because they're, they're being the aggressive. Is it body or hands or both that he's using? There's a little bit of, there's a little bit of everything. I'm waiting for the music to be played. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for Mark Jackson because I thought he's playing a great game. And uh, in the second half, they just let, let him get away with a little bit too much. Miller says that the Pacers have to come up with another game plan. In the first two games of the series, he's made just nine field goals. That's normally a half's work for Indiana's top gun who has to figure a way out of Chicago's defensive morass if the Pacers are going to find a way into the series. At the United Center, I'm David Aldridge, ESPN. David, thanks for the knowledge. Coming up, Frank Thomas took on the Green Munster, and the wall not big enough to contain the big herd. White Sox and Red Sox from Fenway. It's drive time at Bitzer Mitsubishi in Parma. Leave your checkbook at home and lease a brand new Mitsubishi for zero down. You pay absolutely nothing, and you get a super low monthly payment on a quality car or truck loaded with equipment. Galant, Mirage, Eclipse, Montero, 3000 GT, Diamante. Bitzer Mitsubishi has them all, and you can get the one you want with zero down. Because it's drive time at Bitzer Mitsubishi, 11111 Brook Park Road in Parma. Some play basketball, he is basketball. Relive Michael Jordan's career with Slam Dunk merchandise from the Home Shopping Network. Join us as we broadcast live from Michael Jordan's The Restaurant in Chicago, Tuesday, June 2nd at 10 p.m. Eastern. On the Home Shopping Network, we have what you want. There are two kinds of people in the world. There's a uh, idiot. Then there's your big league idiot. And I don't know, but you don't let that turn you 
to mute baseball. These things will happen. The world is lousy. No good. But baseball, baseball is not lousy. The Battle of the Sox in Boston, white versus red. Will Cordero gets a friendly greeting from Mo Vaughn on his return to Fenway Park. Didn't get nearly as friendly a greeting from the fans, but top of the second, no score. Will Cordero. Ballantin makes it. John Ballantin back from a foot bruise, throws out Cordero, who went off for four in the night. And John Ballantin looked no worse to wear at the plate. One of two home runs in the night, solo shot, his fourth Red Sox up, one nothing. Top of the fifth, White Sox now up 3-2. to two. Frank Thomas, our pick to click. After the game, Brett Saberhagen said he deposited it into the night. Six-run fifth for the White Sox. 431-foot homer for Frank Thomas. His seventh Sox up 6-2. They're up 7-2 in the sixth. When Chad Kruder gives a little Albert Bell business to Mark Lemke on his way to second. Ken Kaiser rules it a double play. Lemke left with a concussion in the top of the ninth. Chad Kruder gets a little chin music from Ron Mayhay. He gets hit with a pitch, and then Ray Durham knocks them both in. His fourth home run, the season two-run shot, 9-5 Chicago. That's your score in the bottom of the ninth. Mo Vaughn at the plate, fouls it back behind the plate. The ball bounces out of Chad Kruder's glove, but he makes a nifty, barehanded catch. A circus ending to this highlight. Sox win, 9-5. The White Sox, thank you very much. Jason Beret allowed two runs on six hits in seven innings for his longest outing since 1995. Saberhagen gave up six straight hits at one point. His ERA has now jumped to 5.26. On Wednesday, it'll be Jamie Navarro versus Pedro Martinez. For the second time in nine months, the state of Mississippi has to deal with the shock and sadness of a college football player losing his life in a drowning accident. Nine months ago, Mississippi State starting tailback Kiefer McGee drowned. Tuesday morning, the body of University of Mississippi offensive lineman Joey Embry was found in a golf course pond. Embry apparently drowned after suffering a diabetic-related seizure. He and several teammates had played the golf course earlier in the day and had gone back to retrieve golf balls. Joey Embry would have been 22 years old this August. If you remember correctly, I paid last time. You didn't pay last time. Great. He was, he was Today, National League Probables, Kevin Millwood tries to join Tom Glavin in the six-game winner club as the Braves host the Rocks. The Padres and Pirates play two at Three Rivers Wednesday. Alan Ashby goes for a 6-W for San Diego in the opener against Francisco Cordova. An arbitrator ruled Tuesday that the Philadelphia Phillies still hold the rights to J.D. Drew. The former FSU All-American wanted to become a free agent, and that would have allowed him to sign with the highest bidder. Now, Drew does not sign with Philadelphia by Monday. He goes back into the amateur draft. Coming up, something you may not know about reaching your 40s in the playoffs. On June 12th. Are these really necessary? <laughs> Only if we crash. Harrison Ford. Mayday, mayday. Hits the beach. What are we, like shipwrecked? What? But this trip to paradise. <laughs> we got company. Is no vacation. I just hope you'll join me later today. We'll have a little fun talking sports with actor, comedian Bill Murray. We'll discuss the Cubs, the Bulls, and a little golf. That's up close with Bill Murray later today at 6 Eastern. Michael Jordan did it again. He was just a bomb. He lit the Pacers up for 41, his 196th career 40-point game. Bulls take a two-zip lead over Indiana in the Eastern Conference Finals. Jordan was the first player this postseason to hit for 40. He and Shaq had scored 39 in a game. Jordan's big night kept the 98 playoffs off this list. Did you know that since the advent of the shot clock, the only two NBA postseasons to go without a 40-point score? 1971 and 82. And ironically, the championship teams in both those seasons, the Bucks and Lakers, featured the NBA all time leading score in Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We're tonight coming right back. Mark McGuire goes about a quarter mile in one night. <laughs>